Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Seeking What They Sought. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Leiter. We have an exciting episode in store for you guys today. So we got a chance to sit down with Alicia Johnston. Now, Alicia Johnson is an Andrews University MDiv graduate. She is a former Adventist pastor as well as a queer Adventist theologian. And we got a chance to uh, sit down with her and listen to her journey throughout her life, as well as pick her brain on an affirming theology that she's come to that she believes can work for Adventists. So we're really, really excited to uh, dialogue with her and share this interview with you guys. Before we do, uh, just a couple quick reminders. First, this episode is part of a series called LGBTQ Plus Adventists in the Bible, and it's all about doing intentional listening to Adventists in the LGBTQ Plus community, as well as wrestling deeply with the scriptures. So if you have not listened to the other episode, just a quick uh, invitation uh, to you guys. This episode today is episode three in our series. And so if you haven't heard the others, we recommend going back, giving those a listen, uh, pausing for a moment, uh, just because it gives a little more context to where we're at in this episode. Uh, the next thing is, just want to give you guys another reminder that these episodes do contain sensitive content. Uh, so I uh, just want to let you guys know ahead of time so you can prepare. These episodes in this series do contain topics like sexual assault excuse me, and other things like that. So just want to let you guys know ahead of time so you can plan accordingly. Finally, thank you guys once again so much for listening. Um, it's been really cool to have dialogue with, a, uh, with many of you as you've reached out to us, left comments, or sent us messages. We really appreciate the dialogue always. And uh, so please, if you listen to this episode, you may agree, you may disagree, but we would love to hear your thoughts, feedback, and uh, yeah. We love having conversations, as you know, so please reach out to us. All right. Well, without any further ado, let's dive into this episode with Alicia. Well, here we are. We are here uh, with Alicia Johnston. What an honor it is. And uh, this is a conversation we're really excited to have. Alicia, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm so happy to be doing this. This is like, I love this. Yeah. Well, thanks for being so here. So good. We have a lot to get into today, but uh, we usually like to start these conversations with some getting to know you questions. So tell us about yourself. Where did you grow up? Like where, I always say this to people, new people that I meet, like where did you come from and where are you going? But I'm realizing now, the more I ask that, it's so ambiguous and vague. So where did you, <laughs> tell us, like where did you grow up? Um, where are you from? Yeah, I uh, grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, which is still where I live. And um, yeah, where am I from? Now my mind just blanked. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I I think I was in kindergarten when my parents moved there or whatever. My parents are both first generation Adventists. Um, oh, wow. My 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 dad became Adventist when his local church sent him to Enterprise Academy in Kansas, which is no longer in existence. And um, my mom became Adventist when she took Bible studies with my dad while they were dating. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, oh, nice. uh, what a story. Missionary dating situation. Classic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. wow. Uh, she was already Christian, so it's a little bit ridiculous to call it missionary dating, but that's what we do <laughs> as Adventists, right? <laughs> so That really is what we're built around, is to convert other yeah. Christians. It's true. Uh, what you're saying yeah, is right. he, so, he, he brought her out of Babylon, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, um, so Lisa, uh, one of the reasons that we we have you on is because you've written a book. Um, but you have a, uh, you have you have experience in in pastoring. You were an, you were an Adventist pastor for uh, several years, and oh, am I right on that? Or tell mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that uh, about that journey for you. Yeah, I was um, I was a therapist and since um, the call, a call to go back to become mm. a pastor, which I'd actually had been a theology undergrad. Um, and um, yeah, so it was there's was always kind of a pull. And I just felt this just very strong call to go back uh, to become a to become a pastor to enter ministry. And so um, I kind of left that career behind, went to Andrews. Um, and, uh, it was, um, definitely a leap of faith situation, as you all know, 
it's not all that easy to get a job pastoring as a woman in the Adventist church still today, mm -hmm. although it was a million times easier than it was when I graduated from college. But um, yeah, so I did that. I was kind of terrified, but <laughs> I did it anyway and um, ended up getting getting a call to the Carolina conference and I did church planting there for a while. Um, then my dad was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer and mm -hmm. it just was too much for me. So I ended up mm. moving back to Arizona and miracle of miracles, getting called to a church right there in, in the Phoenix area. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Right. Yeah. So uh, that's where I was when I kind of made my theological shift that made pastoring in the Adventist church <laughs> untenable. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about that. Um, some Please. people may not know <clears throat> about that journey, but yeah, t tell us a little bit about, a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, it, it took me a long time to um, to realize I was attracted to women. It kind of had to hit me on the head um, because I'm bisexual, so I've always been attracted to men as well, and there's not a conversation around that in the Adventist church. <laughs> right. Sure, <laughs> and I, I had literally never met someone who openly identified as, as bi, even in my psychology program. That was like a totally different place um and there's there's issues around that um not just with adventism but also with the lgbtq community sometimes downplaying uh people who are bi or pansexual that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> anyway <laughs> um yeah so it really uh kind of took me a while and i was actually in seminary when i realized it which was not mm. great <laughs> right <laughs> not great um mm. but you know i kind of believed what the church taught. I mean, not kind of like I totally did. And um, I I was really very committed to that. And I, I wish now that I would have studied it in more depth at that time, but I didn't. Mm. And but I was I felt kind of satisfied with it. And I certainly didn't want to lose everything I was working towards. And I just kind of, I don't know, I learned to deal with it. I was very, very aware that the seminary was incredibly unsafe for me to be open and honest about that. Like, mm. it didn't matter what my theology or behavior was like if I was open about that that was going to just be the only thing people knew about me you know mm -hmm. and it would be kind of like a, a controversial thing and and some people would be upset at me and some people would, you know it would just be the only thing I was um mm -hmm. and yeah. it would be difficult and I was and already being a woman trying to go into ministry like can you imagine <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> That's a, it's a huge nope right there. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a happening. huge nope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I was very, very careful to not let it get out or let anybody know. I was very careful who I talked to about it. Very small number of people. Um, um, but, you know, I kind of got into a better place and where it was more manageable. And I um, it, it was kind of not as important a part of my life in terms of my internal world but i also um had a sense of cognitive dissonance and a really strong sense i think like a lot of people do whether you're straight or whether you're part of the lgbtq community just just a strong sense that like clearly the church is missing something mm -hmm. like why why was it not okay for me to be honest why were people so afraid you know why why you know kids are dealing with these things like little kids are dealing with these things and mm -hmm. we're not really there for them to help them and uh yeah i mean when adults think that something is is too hot to touch and too difficult to talk about imagine how a child feels and instead yeah. of kind of taking that burden on ourselves as adults we just kind of leave it there with the kids mm. and that's really difficult um for them and mm. and so you just wow. you have a you have a sense of like something isn't working here like i know this is the character mm. of god and i know this is what the church is doing and there's something in between here that i don't understand and I just kind of lived with that dissonance for a really long time. Um, <clears throat> but that became very untenable for me after the um, Pulse nightclub shooting. Mm. It uh, absolutely kind of wrecked my world. It, it just, it, it felt very personal to me. Mm -hmm. And it felt very difficult to me to see the way my colleagues were responding because it seemed like people were a bit more concerned with like showing themselves to be loving and caring 
than they were with like really the church taking accountability and, and taking an, a, a moment to self-reflect that they're a big part of the problem. Yeah. And so I, if I could butt in, I, in, in yeah. your book, you describe it as it seemed like the church was saying like, hey, like we're willing to host a funeral, which felt like a really big like pat on the back, self like a, pat on the back. Like a pat on the back. Yeah. Like yeah. as a church, as a Christian church to be like, hey, like look at us. And and maybe it's maybe it's not said overtly, but there's a, there is that 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 sense of like, hey, look at us, like we're willing to like be be loving and allow them and like allow them in their death, you know, to to be yeah. hosted in this space. But like we're not actually taking accountability for how the church has contributed to to yeah. the alienation of of. And people. maybe we're the reason why some queer people are dead. Wow. <laughs> like literally. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And it's just wow. Wow. it was very mm-hmm. hard for me. Um, mm-hmm. And and also it, it shows that the baseline is a little bit different because after what other shooting does the Adventist church, does any church ever feel proud of themselves for doing something like that? Like yeah. what church would charge for a funeral of a mass shooting in their neighborhood? Right. Like, like who would do that? So, mm-hmm. so it, it's just like a different baseline, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a different baseline. What, what feels generous to this community is just like normal human behavior to other communities. Mm. It was it was so difficult for me to observe that. And I get, yeah, it was so difficult for me to observe that. And people still get upset at me when I bring that up sometimes because mm. there is a sense of pride that, that the Adventist church has in being willing to do that. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> but for me, that was, that was a real, that was a real like I found myself having the same feelings that LGBTQ people were having in response. Mm-hmm. And that was wild. That was literally the first time like I really felt part of the community mm, was wow. was because of that marginalization and just that shared sense of the meaning of every everything that was happening. Um, yeah, so it just it, it rocked my world really badly. And that con- cognitive dissonance that ex- had existed already just became overwhelming, like completely overwhelming. Like I was like, I, I, you know, like, thank God my, my sermon was already ready for that week. Like that never happens, but I had already prepared my sermon for that week. And, um, you know, so because I was kind of a mess and I remember standing up in front of my church and just telling them like, so this thing happened and we need to acknowledge it. And, I just want to tell you as my pastor, as your pastor, that um, we have a bigger problem here as a Christian church in our treatment of the queer community. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea what the answer to that is, but I, I told my church, like, I'm committed to finding that answer. I'm committed to seeking that answer. And so that wow. kind of gap in between that I knew all existed between the character of God and the behavior of God's people, I was like, I'm going to figure out what's in between. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like, surely, like, this is an answer that God will give me if I if I seek it, just with all my heart, you know. So that's what I, so that's what I did. Um, and that process actually began with saying, okay, I need to really be sure of the theology that I was taught. And I'd, I'd read and was more familiar with it than most people I knew, which made me feel like I was doing good, I guess. But I really wasn't. Like, I, I honest to God, like, I had not even read one entire book hmm. that was affirming. I hadn't even done that. Um, so. And when you I, say affirming, for anyone who's unaware of what that means, like, you mean like affirming theology that. I guess let me ask let me ask you what what that means specifically. Yeah, in, in there's your a perspective. bit of a dialogue in my book about word choice because I know some some people who you know believe the church's teachings say, oh, I am affirming of LGBTQ people as people, but and and so this isn't to say that you know they're not affirming to us as human beings, but that they're not affirming of. Uh, same-sex marriage or transgender identity and for most of us in the community that that really is um, you know affirming our our families or the way that we move and live in the world is a pretty part important part of affirming us so for Mm -hmm. most most of us you know that is kind of necessary but i recognize also that people who aren't coming from that theological position you know it's they're not saying like oh i despise you know queer people or whatever that i like i get that not all those people are doing that i wish i could say none were but (laughs) 
but, um, but you would yeah. you were at this point where you realized I've never actually like explored here you are realizing okay I'm 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 bi but mm -hmm. I've never actually explored the theological perspective that is affirming of that I'm only aware of the theological position that that most people grow up in in Christianity yeah or I was aware of affirming theology through the critiques that come by yeah. you know what mm -hmm. I mean yeah. And um, and the funny part is that I was so removed from any thought of dating women or any desire to do so at this point that it wasn't even about that for me, which it just mm. makes me laugh now. It's hilarious. So it was like not even about that for me, which is just kind of wild. Um, what, what, for you at that point, it was more about we as a church, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's like we as a church need to come to grips with where we're at. Or what we've yeah. done, and like, mm -hmm. and like, what does the Bible actually say? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you weren't, if I hear you correctly, you're not, you weren't approaching it with like a, I really want to, I really want to be bi, and so therefore I'm going to look for a way to support it. You're, like, but you're, like, and and what I, the sense yeah. I get, I, I know we'll talk more about your book, but the I sense did not I get want to your, blow up my entire life. No, no, I was yeah, not interested and, in that. Yeah. And the sense I get from your book is that like you, you really like theology, and so yeah. <laughs> you're not coming at this from like, how can I. And, and I, I please don't uh, misinterpret this as me putting anything on, uh, saying anything about about you. But like, as opposed to, um, I want to warp theology to my own means. Like, you know, that, you're not coming at that. You're like, what does it actually say? Like, how can I, how can I approach this in a way that um, is faithful? That's the sense mm -hmm. I get from your book. Yeah, I don't think that any of us can ever separate the personal implication from our study of the text. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say. Like, no, there was none of that, but I would say I strive towards that. I think mm -hmm. it's more important for us to self-examine what our real motivations are and what our stake is and what our social pressure in the community around us is and try to be as honest about that as we can. Um, but yeah, I, I did try the best I could to set aside mm -hmm. the implications for me and, mm -hmm. you know, losing my job, having to tell my family, like, you know, losing my career really. Like I, I tried to like set those aside as much as I could to try mm -hmm. to be as honest as I could with the text, but it's always an imperfect process. You know, you just have to commit yourself in prayer as much as possible. For mm. sure. And when you get to that point where you're like, I I can't I can't hide this anymore. Not not because of maybe external reasons, but just for yourself it seemed like what was that like as a pastor like, at a church? It was like a yeah. It was like a death. Wow. It was like a death. It, it was really bad for a while there. Yeah, it was mm. It was a really intense grieving process. Um, yeah, and I would say it was a grieving process with a really long tail. <laughs> mm. It was really intense at first and has continued to be very difficult. Yeah, mm, but okay. um, yeah, I mean, I'm very happy with my life now, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's been a, a very difficult road, yeah. So, Alicia, I, if I can ask, um, you know, I think a lot of people uh, kind of in your situation, they would come out and then just kind of leave the church and kind of move on, it seems like, mm -hmm. would be like the standard practice, you could say. What, mm -hmm. uh, why didn't you do that? Why, why have you chosen to kind of stick with Adventism? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um if I don't do it, no one's going to do it. I don't, I just oh. don't think there's anyone as well positioned to do it um, as, as me. And I think it needs to be done uh, for lots of reasons. I mean, mostly the thing that's always queer, closest to my heart is like kids who are growing up in the churches and having a really difficult, incredibly difficult time. That's always closest to my heart. But I also think that even for Adventists to be true to what it means to be Adventist, there needs mm. to be an honest theological conversation. And I don't believe that's happened on this topic. And I don't believe it's even possible for the institution to do that at this point, because mm. if you try to lead such a conversation from a position of institutional legitimacy, you will lose that legitimacy immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm. You know, so, so that kind of makes it impossible. You know, as much as you can say, oh, we can get 150 theologians in the room and they all agree. Like, yeah, if they don't agree, they lose their jobs. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. Yeah. So, and and it's just it's just human nature. None of us, you know, we got to you. We've got to take it into account. Human nature, even for pastors, even for administrators in the church, yeah. it exists for all of us. Um, so I don't really believe this that it's possible for this conversation to be led from a, an institutional position. Mm. But I I do believe that we are a church that's supposed to be. Uh, bottom up, not top down, mm. and that we're a church that's supposed to be centered on scripture and the Bible, and those yeah, are Adventist yeah. values. And so I, I think that my work is really a, a, a return, a call to return to tr- like the Adventist approach on this subject. Yeah, that I don't believe has happened. Can thus I? Far. Yeah, can I ask you about that, Alicia? You, you know, you, you do have this book coming out. It's called The Bible and LGBTQ Plus Adventists. Um, pretty cool. Our, my question kind of connects to what you just said, you know, it, it seems, and, and you, you did send us an advanced copy of the book. So we, we've read, we have, we've, we've had a chance to look at it. You, um, it seems like you're, you're approaching this with a lot of Adventist, kind of an Adventist framework and an Adventist lens. And with, at least it seems an intent to be faithful to Adventist hermeneutics and, and ideas as it pertains to approaching scripture. What made you, why was that so important to you to approach the book? Um, It was the book that I needed before I came out, you know, Um, Mm. it was a book that I needed that, um, yeah, it was very personal, I guess. And, and also because Adventists, as you know, tend to use Adventist resources. Um, one of the only Very denominations true. that has a phrase like non-Adventist, right? There's not non-Lutherans and non-Methodists. Mm. It's a very, you know, it's a very close group. And there, so some of it's cultural, but some of it's like real theological differences, especially around the Sabbath and creation um, and some other issues around the Old Testament as well. So so, so there's, some, there's some real specific Adventist ish, uh, questions that need to be addressed as well. So both of the, kind of both of those things, yeah. Um, Alicia, I'm obviously the only one here that didn't go to like theology, you know, school or <laughs> seminary. Um, and I think, and like in my perspective, a lot of Adventists, you know, I think we haven't really delved into the topic ourselves, like with scripture and um, the text. I know I haven't taken a deep dive into the topic um but i think you know like reading your book and was kind of the first time i'd ever really heard of affirming theology or you know kind of that perspective of um you know so i guess what my question is can you uh kind of explain you know for for the audience uh who might not be familiar with that term like give me the not the pitch, but uh, what what is affirming the theology? Pitch. You know, for for you and because I think it's very interesting. It's one, I've always wanted to have a conversation with someone from you know the LGBTQ community that still believes in the Bible and and you know because I think for most Christians we're like we think it's you know they think it's clear cut, right? You know, homosexuality is a sin; it's bad. And, um, like the Bible's clear about this, but. Mm-hmm. you know uh, from reading mm-hmm. your book you, you you make the argument that it's not quite that clear cut mm-hmm. can you talk more about that yeah i mean i think first off we need to um gain a little bit more theological humility and be open to the text because you know for maybe what i'm just take a stab here 1800 well, actually, things began to shift. When did things shift? Whatever. Anyway, for like 1800 years, the accepted position was that the Bible is clear that uh, sin came through women and that women are morally inferior to men, like morally and intellectually inferior to men, and that women are a source of temptation and that um, sexual pleasure is a bad thing. And, you know, it's unfortunately necessary for procreation. But, you know, um, it's 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 really not good because that was the avenue through which sin came into the world. So, of course, you know, Jesus was born not through sex because sex is evil. And, you know, of course, Paul says the only reason, um, you know, that that if you absolutely have to have sex, well, at least get married. 
you know, get married to do it, but better to not have sex, right? Like this is yeah. like the clear mm-hmm. position of the of the Bible for a very long time. The, um, the clear position of the Bible for a very long time was that slavery was a way of dealing with sin and that it was a God ordained institution in order to deal with races that were more sinful than other races. Mm-hmm. And the scripture, the, the slavery in the Old Testament is race-based slavery. And it was a way of dealing with sin. It was instituted by Noah, the man of God, uh, through his prophetic interpretation, or for, through his pro- prophetic um, words at the end of his life towards his son, Ham. And I mean, it was just so clear to them. There were no abolitionists in the Bible. The slavery is affirmed again and again, and even expanded in the New Testament to where people can, um, you know, the people of God can enslave one another in perpetuity, which didn't exist in the Old Testament. So, you know, there's just, first, we've got to get a little bit of perspective on the fact that just because it seems super clear doesn't mean we're right. Like, we have to, like, let that Mm -hmm. sink in, because I really think that half the battle for any of us is a spiritual one and is, is one of having a degree of openness to um having a degree of openness to the possibility that we could be dramatically wrong and and that maybe our interpretation of this text is not correct so i I think honestly that's the first (laughs) and most difficult hurdle especially when you're surrounded by people and you've heard again and again the bible is clear on this topic the bible is clear on this topic the bible is clear on this topic um just just playing getting around that bias is like the hardest thing you know yeah. that that it feels like mm-hmm. i spend most of my energy on so i was gonna ask so do you I feel like you spend like, more energy on that that question than everything else yeah i mean often i feel like i i feel like i do i mean it's everything about the way, the way that i wrote the book you know and um yeah and i mean i'm i'm not this is for me too right like it, it took me forever to examine this and to, and to think this um yeah it's it's pretty difficult to come to the bible as a f- fresh with a fresh slate you know it seems like it, it's almost embedded in adventist dna to equate or or connect this idea of the bible is clear on this with that's how i know i can trust the bible mm. and this is what truth is and that truth is clear and that god does not uh god does not make unclear what is right versus wrong what's clear is you know what what truth is right Mm -hmm. um and that anything that deviates from that this concept of of um that some things in in scripture might take time to study more deeply and that you might need to change your position on things it it is considered a slippery slope for many this idea of well if if it's not clear on this and we have so many texts and i know we'll get into that in a little bit the clobber texts right Mm -hmm uh if it's not clear in this way then what can i trust in the bible maybe maybe there's a fear of disillusionment with scripture mm. and that oh it's going to lead down this dark path of everything is gray in the bible and and that um it's not clear what god wants and so then do we have adventist identity after we we even allow uh that to and i'll use just a in quotations just infiltrate our our way of perceiving what truth is our, our tenets of Adventism and, and even just in Christianity, right? That's a larger Christian concern. So Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the thing I've seen is it's, it's embedded in Adventist DNA. That's probably why you've had to address it every time is there's, there's just a natural concern that if we, if we take that approach that we're, we're giving up everything that it's going to unravel Mm -hmm. the sweater of Adventism. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting. I think I was, I was talking with someone like, uh, and I was saying that, I, I, my sense of one of the reasons that the LGBTQ plus conversation is so big is, is actually that it's for a lot of people, it's not actually about LGBTQ people or even that issue mm. in and of itself. It's the problem that scripture seems to be so clear on it. And so if we change our, if we, if even if in your heart you feel compassion and you want to say like, Hey, like it just, yeah, logically maybe some of this stuff makes sense. There's still that I if if we let scripture go, or at least our like the the way that we approach scripture, and the rest of it goes with it. Everything else is like mm-hmm. everything else is up for for however the heck you want to interpret it, and so that almost 
and, I'm, and I want to be careful and say that I, I think for a lot, a lot of people, it is just the LGBTQ question. Like that is the problem. But I think for, for a number of people, it's just, it's like, what do I do with the Bible? Like I, the scripture mm-hmm. is scripture and I love people. What the heck do I do with this? And then what was so interesting about reading your book, Alicia, was here I am, somebody who I would say I pride myself in coming at scripture with an, with an open lens like okay i want to i want to say i want to actually figure out what the text is saying in context as opposed to like what what i or other people might be putting on it but then it was hilarious to read through your book and as you put issues like slavery and women and the treatment of women um next to the issue of of the lgbtq question it was so interesting because (laughs) there was this one point where i realized like wow this is this is the same like we 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 treat all of we treat all of the texts that address those issues with kind of like an ambiguity and like oh yeah i get that it says it clearly then but there's some context and all that stuff Mm -hmm. and then we get to this one specifically and it's like this is black and white it's clear and for some reason i Mm -hmm. had never made that connection myself Mm -hmm. and then you seeing it laid out in your book i was like oh this kind of this kind of hurts my pride a bit (laughs) i feel like yeah I know it. I felt it myself. I know it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it was wild to me. It was wild to me to pull out some of those, some of those, some of those quotes and some of the parallels, even the exact same words sometimes that are said. And I, I think if you look historically at theology um, and issues that the church has faced, this has happened multiple times. Mm-hmm. where uh, people were looking at the text through what I would call like a uh, manual kind of approach or like an index approach, you know, where you say, okay, what's the topic? You know, you say, okay, here's my question. My question is, is, is um, same-sex marriage okay? All right, so now I'm going to like look for the text that clearly gives me an answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Um and and so you're kind of treating the Bible like a manual, which it's not written like a manual. I think if God mm-hmm. wanted us to have a manual, it would read a little bit like your car manual, right? So, mm-hmm. so you're kind of treating it that way. You're kind of trying to take all the texts that are on topic of that, and you're trying to put them all against each other. So like uh, if you're doing this for like how you treat your children, for example, you'd say spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, don't, you know, don't you know, give your kids limits, but don't aggravate them. Like you'd kind of pull all those texts together and you'd say, here's what the Bible says about that. This is not the way that Jesus taught us to read the Bible. Jesus taught that um, love Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength and love your neighbor of yourself and all the law and the prophets hang on this. Hmm. So literally the most important text for every topic in the Bible is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the most important text for literally every subject. <laughs> like wow. that's what Jesus taught us. And that the law is an ex- explanation of that, right? And that the law is an explanation of that. So we're really good at doing that on some subjects. Yeah. Hmm. Especially like the subject of slavery. We're really good at doing that. <laughs> hmm. But a lot of subjects, we're really doing good at doing that at like representative government. Hmm. Because the Bible talks about it. And this is not a wild thing. Like, the divine right of kings was taught for hundreds and hundreds of years. God oh, yeah. establishes the king and gives the king mm-hmm. authority, and your job is to obey the king. And, and yeah, if you about... look up texts about the government in the Bible, that's what it's going to say. Yeah. Like that's... But, to, but today, we're like, it, everyone's made in the image of God. Everyone has a right to have a say. So like, it's just, it's a entirely different, and, and we're more willing to push aside some of the things that say, like, divine right of king language for the like we're made in the image of god like this is how this is how this supports kind of where we're at and this, this is conservative today. theology this is conservative yeah, yeah. theology yeah, yeah. right right this is conservative theology the only thing is we haven't applied those same conservative theological lenses to this subject instead mm. this subject has become one where we strip out all the nuance and say, well, this text right here says a man who lies with a man is an abomination and should be killed. We're not going to kill him now, obviously, but the Bible <laughs> says it's wrong, right? So, could, so you actually, could you unpack that a little bit where you're saying that we don't even apply, conser- conservatives don't even apply their own conservative theological principles to these texts. And your argument in the book, if I'm 
if I'm reading it correctly, is that in essence, we can apply some of those conservative theological um, or uh, perspectives looking at scripture and come out in an affirming theology, which is a is a shocking statement to hear. I know. But I will say that as I read through the book, as I, as I read through the book, I, um, and I want to be careful with how I say this, not because I have anything wrong with saying I agree with you, as opposed to I, I, I want to take more time to sit with it. But it was interesting when I read through it, I didn't come across these points where I was like, oh, well, that's a huge logical hole. Like, I felt like you you had a really solid argument for it. So I'd love to kind of hear your, your, your perspective on, okay, there's conservative ways of looking at it, and they actually help the conversation. Yeah, and I think you had a question um, on the Google Doc um, about what are your goals for the book? And I think institutionally or big picture, my goal slash dream for the book is that people would see that affirming theology as legitimate. Like if you mm. get to the end and you're like, oh, I don't believe this, but I can see that like an honest Adventist could believe this, mm -hmm. who should be in good and regular standing in the Adventist church. Like this is a legitimate perspective. Wow. Yeah. You know, wow. like that's, that's what, that's really kind of what my goal and my dream would be more so than that everyone would agree, read it and agree with it, you know? Yeah. It, um, it's, it's just yeah. interesting, Alicia, sorry to interrupt you. Oh. I, I, I just wanted to, before I forget to say it, like, kind of the i'll just address it the elephant in the room is three of us at least in some way are employed by the avenus church right uh and and by addressing that i say it seems just so foreign the idea of a a culture atmosphere that allows for having um open discussion in a way that doesn't feel like the stakes are super high mm -hmm. and that just stifles honest conversation and, uh, and part of it stems from this idea that once you're employed by the church, you have everything figured out theologically, at least on the front. You know, the way you discuss, you know, uh, I'm a Bible teacher, so I, when it comes to anything theological or anything biblical, like, it's, I've got it all put together. Sean, what, uh, does, Ezekiel, the, is, what does Ezekiel 4, 5 say? Let's go. Come on. Bible teacher. Let's go. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am literally the worst. I also teach history. I am notoriously bad at trivia and these guys can tell, they, they can tell you cause, cause blackmail, there's legit blackmail yeah. they have against me. You're, you're uh, I'm notorious. I'm horrible. Okay. <laughs> I am bad at a lot of things, but trivia is my worst. I'm horrible at trivia, but, but no, getting back to it. I, I really think that the stakes seem so high in, and not just this subject, but especially this subject, but in other things too. Right. Uh, if it's controversial topics within the church, it just seems like there's not a a space that's that's there, or f for sure has not been for the longest time mm. to to discuss, and especially as Adventist professionals, right, the ones that are that are in, at the pulpit in front of the classroom in the the admin offices in the conference, there's not that space to discuss. And it might be said that it is like, oh yeah, you can say what you want, but but can you? And, I would and, not be surprised if y'all get pressured to take this podcast down. Hmm. I'm going to be so, honest with you. So it, and we so, actually, I know you did a podcast with another guy who was a pastor. And yeah, I remember no him. It's available. Is it really? I remember him posting about it in a group that I'm part of. And, Same, yeah. And how much flack that there was. I don't remember if it was from the group or he was talking about getting flack from other places. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely a reality. But I yeah. think that's what's interesting. Like you, what, what you said, Alicia, of like your goal is not so much to convince people, but hey, this is like a legitimate perspective, potentially. That, that would be thing, nice. <laughs> here's the thing. If the Bible is so clear, then isn't reading my book just going to make it how obvious, that more obvious that I'm wrong? Right. Yeah, that's true. The, the isn't fear, it, the fear, isn't well, studying the culture and the, well, the cultural background and the context just going to make it more clear that I'm wrong? Not yeah. muddy the waters. Like if the but, Bible's really so clear, let's just dive into it, and I'll obviously be wrong, and we'll be done. The the response is, and I'm not saying this is this is just. I'm just telling you this is what the response will be, is that it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be a deception. Like oh yes, it will be wrong, but there's so many that will be deceived or swayed by this wrong mm. view that will lead them into a path of darkness and mm. and lead to uh, uh, chaos and 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 disorder amongst the 
the church, use. right? That's the that's the fear. Why have why have I heard those exact things from somebody from multiple people in Adventism over the course of my entire life? Because that's the fear. That's the that's the <laughs> that's concern. So, that's so it's about various things. That that exact sentence. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But it, mm-hmm. I, if I could come back, Alicia, and, and ask, because because in essence, it's it is you're saying that like you can, in essence, you're saying that you can be conservative and apply the same principles you're applying to most of the rest of Scripture, and mm-hmm. come out as affirming. <clears throat> and I'm really curious to hear you unpack that a bit. Yeah, let's dive in. Um, so we we already brought about we already brought up a little bit of guess. So I'll give mm-hmm. so I'll just dive into that one. <clears throat> I'll give you like a big picture overview of kind of my understanding of this text. Um, uh, but I'll say, like, it's possible that I'm, uh, as I say in my book, like, it's possible that I'm wrong. This one's, this, uh, sometimes understanding the Old Testament can be pretty tricky. But um, in Leviticus 18, 22, and 20, 13, uh, it says it's wrong for a man to lie with a man as with a woman. So um, first, I want to take a step back and share with you what I learned in my Old Testament law class that the Lord had me take while I was at the seminary because he knew what was in front of me, apparently. <laughs> in my Old Testament law class <laughs> at, at the seminary, uh, which was like my favorite class, it was just a small group of people sitting around the table wrestling with the Old Testament law. Mm. Um, we learned, and you can also read this in Roy Gaines' book, The Old Testament Law for Christians, I think, something like that. Uh, Roy, But it's uh, by Roy Gaines. And he I was going to ask about this as well. Who was the professor of that class? Uh, Richard Davidson. Oh, Davidson. Okay. And I adore him. And I so feel guilty good. every time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So when you read the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And the word Torah means law. We tend to think of law in Roman terms. We tend to think of law in law more in like, or like a modern legislative lens where the legislature passes law, a law or an ordinance. And now this is what it is. And now a judge needs to apply that law as objectively as they can. And that's the way that we think about the law. This is, we have no zero examples of the law being treated this way in the Old Testament. And this approach to the law is, is one that was developed much later by the Romans. So um, what we instead see in the Old Testament text is that, um, you know, the Torah is not, it's the law, but it's not a book of rules. It's a combination of narrative and legal code, right? Those two are woven together. And, you know, if we want to understand the socio, political, whatever you want to say it, cultural context of the Old Testament law, the best thing to do, which I learned in seminary, is to look at what the Torah says, what it tells us about what the context was for that law and what the meaning of the law was. And we find that in the narratives. So the narratives of the Torah help us to understand the the laws of the Torah. What this is like, this is why it was written, you know, like this is the reason why it is written down because of these things that we are going to explain to you. So uh, that's like conservative principles for understanding the Old Testament. Like, obviously, we can't just apply the Old Testament in a one to one correspondence. Like, I'm totally okay using a toilet, even though the Old Testament says to bury outside the camp. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, that's ridiculous and absurd. But it's so easy to pick up in a passage like that, that you do it subconsciously without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Right? You never stop and think about that. One of the examples I talk about in my book, <clears throat> is that roofs are supposed to have parapets, which is just like a, like a guard so that you can't fall off the roof because they would hang out on their roofs, right? Mm-hmm. So like they don't say your roof should have a parapet if it's flat and if you're up on it. No, because it was always flat and people were always up on the roof. So it, it like if it's an always that way situation, you're not going to get like an explanation that has no application to them. Like, can you imagine a Bible mm-hmm. in which it was written to the to the Jews, like your roof should have a parapet unless you have this thing called snow that you guys haven't experienced before, but it's like little frozen right. crystals falling from the ground and some places in the world, lots and lots of it falls. And so your roof <laughs> needs to be slanted so no one can hang out on the roof. And so, you know, like, can you imagine a Bible that was written that way? Like we're so right. arrogant when we say, when we expect the Bible to be written for our cultural context. Yeah. 
as if mm. like we're the only humans who've wow. ever existed. Like if it has to yeah. be written for our cultural context, then it also has to be written for the 1200, you know, it has to be written for 400. It has yeah. to be written in every language and culture that ever existed. And that's simply not the text that we have. Yeah. So when people mm. take a text like Leviticus 18.22 and say, well, look, it just says a man should not lie with a man as with a woman. There's no exceptions. It's totally clear. The Bible doesn't give any, it doesn't say, but if, but if you're, if you're gay or if you're in a committed marriage relationship with someone, that's an exception. It doesn't say that. So there are no exceptions. This yeah. is simply not the way that conservatives interpret the Old Testament law on other what you're, what you're saying in that case is that, you know, if we were to say, well, it doesn't say it doesn't give exceptions. You're saying other things don't give exceptions. So to hold that text to a, to a different standard than you're holding other other ones to isn't a fair assessment. Yeah, it, it's 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 a different it's a different measure that's being used for this text mm. than what's being used for other texts now. Mm. If we looked and examined the Torah and the narratives of the Torah, and we see lots of people getting into same-sex marriage, or even one person <laughs> getting into a same-sex marriage, you know, if we see someone like really asking that question, and then we saw that text, that would be a different story. But that's not what we see. So let me let's go back and unpack what we actually do see for. Um, yeah, for a minute. Sometimes I'm a little verbose, so <laughs> no, this I'll try. Is good. To, it's I'll great. try to. I'll try to give that overview. Um, so, what do we actually see in the text when we when we say when we ask the question, what does the narrative of the Torah reveal about same sex sex? And I, I stick to the Torah, the first five books, because they're a unit, and this is what Leviticus is part of, and. You know, it doesn't change when you go out of the Torah too much. It, it, you, you might add temple prostitution, but I, but I think that when you're really, I, I believe really in looking at the unit, the Torah as a unit, and so I use yeah. that as my guide. It, it, it's, it doesn't make the case any worse for me if you go outside the Torah, but that's kind of a, a sound principle of biblical interpretation. So, if you look at Genesis chapter nine, you have the first example of something maybe kind of sexual that happens between um, a man and a man. And <clears throat> in one of my classes in the seminary, <laughs> I remember the professor, and this is in my book, the professor saying, um, this is the story of Noah and his son Ham. And the professor saying that Ham was a homosexual and he went in on his father and saw his father naked and was aroused by this and went and told his brothers about how aroused he was by his father. That's, that's a little reading bit, a lot. That's interesting. That's reading, reading a lot, lot into the text. <laughs> it's a little weird. Um, like you don't think about like straight people walking in on their mom, like a straight guy walking on his mom and being like, "Ooh la la, it's a naked woman." <laughs> right. Oh, that is gross. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's it's some of that like subtle like oh gay people are different and more sexual than we are kind of mm. um, bias that creeps into the theology a lot of times with the accepted theology to to think like oh they experience their sexuality like dramatically different than us so they'd be like turned on by their dad um, a much um, I think more consistent understanding of this is um, so what happened is you know the flood happened and the land dried out and they landed it was just like the one human family that was left and noah being traumatized the first thing he did was like grow grapes to make some wine and get drunk <laughs> yeah right so so he's like he's like drunk probably is like i don't know i imagine it's like his first batch of wine or whatever and he gets like wasted and he is in his tent totally naked like passed out drunk and um Ham comes in and so the Old Testament often refers to sex as like to uncover someone's nakedness. Mm -hmm. This text says that Noah had uncovered his own nakedness. So it's kind of like a little bit of a sexual illusion, but it doesn't sound like sex. And the, and the word for the way that Ham looked at him is kind of like, uh, like, like a sexualized gaze. Um, and then he immediately goes out and tells his brothers 
And his brothers respond by being mortified by Ham that he would do this. And they come into the tent and they take a blanket and they walk backwards so that they won't see their father and they cover him. And um, my understanding about this story, I think, you know, if, if Ham had been, if Ham's goal had been sexual arousal, he wouldn't have told his brothers, like, that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> right like like ham's purpose was actually to tell his brothers to be mm. to to and to thereby humiliate his father like ham was humiliating his father that's what he was doing when yeah. he was telling his brothers mm. you know yeah. nakedness and shame are connected from, mm -hmm. from the beginning from genesis and so here noah is revealing his shame and his nakedness he's the patriarch of the family he's the leader he's the one with the power and authority and now mm. here comes ham and he's going to shame his father and he's going to gain power and authority for himself but his yeah. brothers are having none of it and so they undo the shame by literally covering his body without ever looking at it hmm. so yeah. um that's that's my read of the text that I think is the most consistent with the narrative and the values of of the Torah. Yeah. Um, and then you have uh, at the end of his life, Noah curses Ham, um, and this is actually the first mention of slavery in the Bible. Sam and his descendants will be enslaved because of the sin of Ham, and Ham's mm. descendants are the Canaanites. Yeah. And so then, like, mm -hmm. let's look at when is the next time the Canaanites are mentioned in the Bible? And the next time the Canaanites are mentioned in the Bible, you have Abraham and Lot looking out over the land and seeking to divide the land of Canaan once they've arrived there. And Lot chooses to go live where? With the Canaanites. The Canaanites. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And the experience that he has in with the Canaanites in Sodom is what Ham did, but now it's grown into something much more hmm. much more wow. intense and much worse mm. yeah. and so what this what the um if you if you read genesis 18 and 19 in parallel um you get just this very this very um this very re very reinforced very you know there are multiple points at which you see that abraham is being contrasted with the people of Sodom. Abra Abraham is a generous host. He goes above and beyond to provide. And, you know, we think of, you talk about hospitality and we think of like maybe Southern hospitality and how wonderful Southerners are and gracious. Um, but when you're traveling in a world that doesn't have hotels that you can stay in, you know, that doesn't have the same safety and reliability that we have in our world, a hospitality is actually a matter of life and death. Like yeah. if people are kind yeah. to you and good to you on your journey, you will be safe. And if yeah. they're not, you could die. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about whole hospitality in this context. And Abraham is like above and beyond. You know, he he kills the fatted calf for them. He takes care of them. He just shows them this so much when, kindness. This is when God and the and two other beings show up in essence. Yeah. And he yeah he does all of that. Whereas it's contrasted with with lots of experience and. Well, with the people of Sodom and the whole experience there, when the angels go there, they they are threatened with all sorts of violence, um, mm -hmm. sexual and other, in essence. And there's that's that's a contrast you're saying. Is, yes, yes, yeah. that's the contrast. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I forget that. Yeah, so so you have like one person who shows generosity and like. The, the, you know, God's representatives, or the angels are like there in the city square and Lot's like, look, it's not safe. Nobody invites them in. And Lot's yeah. like, look, it's not safe for you to even be here. Mm -hmm. Come stay with me. And then the Canaanites, who, by the way, have been viciously attacked by others and, you know, have have experienced some major like sense of vulnerability from their attacks by other nations respond by just making trying to like put the fear of god in everybody that this is not a safe place and you don't want to mess with us mm -hmm. and that's the way that they treat i mean everything in the narrative just kind of reinforces this again and again that's the way that they treat these guys and it says that all the men of the town came out which is of course a reference to abraham was like if you can find even five good people in this town mm. spare them and no, every single one of them comes out and they want to forcibly gang, gang rape these men. 
yeah. mm -hmm. forcibly gang rape them. This is uh, humiliation. This is a war. This is war crime. We see these things happening in the world today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not something we're unfamiliar with. And this is the same um, spirit of what Ham did, but much more intense. Yeah. much more intense mm -hmm. and so you see kind of the beginning of canaan and now you see the fruit of that beginning in sodom and you see this this attempt to humiliate and put the fear of god in people and this is the context we have when we try to understand what what it might mean for a man to sleep with a man or to lie with a man as with a woman because in a patriarchal society the best way that you can shame a man is to treat him sexually like a woman mm -hmm. it's just all fits together it, so, it fits so your claim just to be clear um and i and i had never seen that connection ham ham into ham and noah and then that connection into that story that with there's same um overtones narrative overtones in it but in essence what you're saying is that what you see in leviticus is a result of stories like that where it's less about homosexuality per se and more about power dynamics uh shame the uh treatment of others in essence um yeah. and i don't want to oversimplify it but i'm trying to, i'm just trying to clarify yeah, yeah, that yeah. i have that um, right and before we even get to a question of is it about homosexuality we have to ask what is it actually about mm. yeah, yeah and then later we can ask does what it's about apply to the question we're asking today instead of trying to Ooh, force yeah. it onto our question, which is what we too often do. Like yeah. we we have a question in search of an answer. And yeah. so we force things into being an answer when they're not. And even if you look at the text of mm. Leviticus 18, it makes it even further clear because it says after kind of calling out man, like man sleeping with a man is an abomination. It, it says just a couple verses later, you shall not do the abominations that the people did before you on this land. And what was that land? Mm, the land of Canaan. Yeah. yeah. So it's even wow. right there in Leviticus 18. Like when you really use that conservative hermeneutical approach of allowing the scripture to interpret itself and be its own guide to understanding the cultural and historic background for the scripture, I I think that this is the most compelling understanding of what the text could mean. Yeah. I really like how you said that, that instead of actually asking, is this pertaining to what we're asking about? instead of asking what is it just saying mm -hmm. and if it mm -hmm. does happen to to answer a question we have today that is a byproduct of what the text is is saying on its own apart from what i'm asking exactly and we need to focus yeah. on what does the text say and what does it teach us and i think yeah. like if if you want to take leviticus 1822 seriously you got to focus on prison reform in this country you have to focus on war crimes you have to focus on the u.s military mm -hmm. and like those are the ways that you really look at how this text is being played out in our modern in our modern world. Like you've yeah. got to really ask yourself those questions and try to address those issues. And you also have to ask yourself, when outsiders come into our community, how are we treating them? Oh, wow. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> wow. Like, like these are the things that this text is really challenging with. So this isn't asking. And when we focus and we just want to jump to LGBT people as if that's the only people this text applies to, when really like the the moral weight of this text in my in my understanding like looking as close as i can at the scripture is like these are the things we need to be concerned about here mm -hmm. and the yeah. irony is that the way that the adventist church has treated queer people and lgbtq people has sadly been more in line with sodom than with abraham <laughs> wow what a <laughs> that's quite an indictment i <laughs> that hurts. I, even, even, yeah. I wow. Yeah, that's just a painful thing to hear. Wow, yeah. Alicia. Um, you know, I guess playing devil's advocate. You know, you, you sort of outlined this path and this journey. This maybe tracing this Anthony, thread. Anthony, we've gone over this before. You say devil's advocate, and what that means is that the devil's position is the conservative position. So what you're, <laughs> what are you saying, Anthony? I, I'm not, I'm not going to engage with this line of questioning. You, you can speak to my lawyer. Um, <laughs> I guess to pose the question that I think would be asked in maybe more conservative circles, you know, you've drawn out this thread of power, shame, you know, kind of being traced through those stories. But when it comes to a text like Leviticus 18, 
Um, you know, it seems like the text is clear. A man shall not lie with a man. That's an abomination. If you just read the words, it's, it's right there. How do you respond to that type of question? I mean, to me, the problem there is an issue of consistency. Hmm. And if, if that's the approach you're going to use on that text, then you got to use it on all the texts. Hmm. I, I mean, the Bible is clear. A slave should submit to their master, even if their master is unjust and beating them unfairly, because this is what Jesus did when he submitted to lashings and death on a cross. Hmm. What do you do and with that? And that's what that's what Paul says. He Paul says you should submit to hmm. to your oh, master Peter, actually. too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but what's interesting, and you make the case in the book that in essence it's like it's that's such a we would not today under our current moral understanding be like yeah you should do that. So we it's, it's unacceptable. Look, it's unacceptable. Yeah. <laughs> like well, and, anybody who says that, like, get out of the church. Yeah. Like, forget <laughs> it. Like, you don't belong here. Like, gosh, yeah. Uh, and I think the irony of that approach is that ostensibly you're saying, look how seriously I take the text. Yeah. Right. I'm right. going to take the plain meaning of this text seriously. But because you're doing that selectively, mm -hmm. it's all about you and not the text. Oh, God. Yeah. Wow. Because <laughs> you're picking which text you're going to apply that way, and you're ignoring the others based on your own internal compass. So you're not yeah. wrestling with the text, and you're not allowing the text to lead you. So if, if we could go deeper, how would you interpret a text like that? And how, how have you come to understand a, a text like Leviticus 18.22 that does seem to be so clear? And then she just described it. That no, was the well, she, entire she, line of her... No, for sure. I mean, she's describing her approach. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to understand. I'm, try, I'm trying to be a learner. <clears throat> <laughs> I could give you another thing on Leviticus 18. Please, yeah, like, give it all. So one of the things that um, Adventist conservatives particularly say about Leviticus 18 is that um, this, this chapter of the Bible is the chapter that is an explanation of what um, pornea is in the New Testament. It's an explanation of what fornication is and so Adams will say is this is us trying to return to Genesis and everything in this passage is actually uh, calling us back to Genesis. But if you actually look at, um, I might get this slightly wrong on the numbers, but if you actually count up the, the number of rules in Leviticus 18, it's 20 rules and about 15 of them apply to how to manage a polygamous household hmm. <laughs> interesting right and a Those lot are of definitely them applicable are, today. are saying things like don't have sex with don't have sex with your wife's mother don't have sex with your sister don't have sex with your wife's sister don't have sex with your father don't like like all these kind of like look i know you guys are all living in one house together and I know that you've got the patriarch who's in charge of everybody and is like the final law in this household. But look, there's limits even on that patriarch. You can't just go have sex with every, everyone you want to have sex with. And also noticeably absent on that list is don't have sex with sex workers. Hmm. And wow, there's well, a, that's, right? That's, it's that's, a little that's, uncomfortable. That's interesting. <laughs> especially, and especially when you consider how many, how many stories in scripture include people who are prostitutes uh, or sex workers and it's yeah you would think that that would be a pretty clear well especially it's because like of, kind of a, yeah and also if you're gonna take mm. the narrative of genesis one and two at face value actually god has commanded them to do the things that leviticus 18 forbids because you only got adam and eve and when they have kids those kids can only sleep with each other so literally, <laughs> these rules are actually in contradiction with each other, not at all in harmony with each other, because we're in a different phase and a different place. Hmm. Yeah, you, so, you, sorry, Jesse, you're... Well, I was gonna say, Alicia, I know you you more fully describe the things that you've described today in your book, and there's even more things you attach to that, that to me at least seem to, to have a lot of a logical consistency to them all throughout. So you described the law, what was the actual purpose behind, like how how is the law actually read or not read, uh, applied 
um, you go back into Genesis. What is the purpose of of it's not good for man to be alone, and the the man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. You go through you go through all of that and set that up. And I know you go through stuff um, in in the New Testament as well, in Romans and such. But um, can I just say one of the things that uh, for someone who for someone like me who has not engaged with affirming affirming theology as you have uh, as you had except for through critics of it or critiques of it. One of the things that's really easy is, for instance, affirming theology um, sometimes gets it. Well, some some people who, who would describe themselves as affirming theologians will say things like um, Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship, or at least it's hinted at. And therefore, like that's present there, which has always felt like one of the weakest arguments in like you read through the story you can dive into it as much as you want and it's it, it's a pretty big stretch to get to the place of saying that and so when you hear stuff like that the the way that affirming the way that you begin to think about affirming theology is it's a weak argument it's stretching stuff it's just mm. trying to make the bible fit you know your own perspective like uh, you're, you're trying to get the bible to fit a modern context how you want it to to to, to be said and so it's very easy to just be like, well, this is silly. Like it's it's just it's bad theology in essence. What's interesting is that you're coming at it from the perspective of I want to be the most robust theologically that I can can be, and be faithful to to Adventist belief to to Scripture as it's supposed to be read, and you yet come out in a space that would make a lot of people feel uncomfortable if they haven't gone through the process of like reading your book or going through the process of, of um, the the things that you've said in, in, in uh, for instance, okay, I'm not looking at this text to answer my question. I'm asking what the text says. So like that's one principle in addition to many others that you apply. What, what would you say is um, your, and th- this is, I, I mean this because I'm curious, like what would you say is, is your, feeling about a lot of the affirming theology out there do you feel like it's more robust than than many perceive it to be do you Mm -hmm. feel like it's it is full of holes i mean what what do you what do you think Uh, it totally depends on who you're reading yeah and what you're reading the the first churches to jump on board with affirming theology were much more in line with like liberal uh, higher criticism and those kinds of interpretations of scripture by the way these were also the first churches to jump on board with like integration so we shouldn't be too quick to say (laughs) you know what i mean Mm. they've actually been the ones who've got the moral issues right where the conservatives have consistently gotten the moral issues wrong um but they're they don't have the same uh lens for interpreting the scripture Mm. as conservative christians do and so a lot of the the kind of first movers in that space were really coming from a position of um like seeing scripture truly through like a liberal hermeneutic that is not something that conservatives believe Um, and and a lot of the people who are still out there in that space are still doing that and sometimes conservative Christians will intentionally cherry pick those particular perspectives Mm -hmm. to try to discredit affirming theology. Um, So yeah, I mean, it's for sure definitely out there. Uh, But if you look at the work of, um, I think, I think probably like James Brownson is the best out there Mm -hmm. for now, uh, the Bible, gender and sexuality. I think his work is really excellent. Um, He lives like a mile from the seminary and I don't think they've ever talked to him Mm -hmm. or like an hour from the seminary. I don't think they've ever talked to him. Um, he's he's just he's a new testament professor and um anyway he's so you got you got him um the reformation project and matthew vines um kathy baldock and ed oxford their work um i mean i have a resource list i could give you guys that you could post in your show notes if you want to Mm -hmm. but there's really great stuff out there and there's really bad stuff out there so you know and honestly like this is a funny part for me when I really became affirming was when first I read those affirming books and then I went back and read some of the heaviest hitters of the accepted theology. And I was like, Oh, this doesn't hold up the way I thought it does. So like, Mm -hmm. definitely like you got to go back and forth. You got to read both being as, as informed as you can. Like, I'm I'm not at all going to say like, don't like read, read everything. 
yeah. pay attention to footnotes there though because especially when it comes to some of the greek and roman backgrounds some of the stuff people say is just like straight up wrong but um yeah, yeah. so pay attention to to footnotes but yeah like just yeah i don't know i don't know if that's helpful. could i circle back to <laughs> no it was thank you I was just going to circle back really quick to what I mentioned before, which is there's such a fear of, uh, I don't know if I'm using this prop properly, but ecumenical behavior, just this idea of looking beyond the Adventist church or the accepted theology, as you've said, mm -hmm. that it's a slippery slope and that it will lead to disorder and, and a loss of, of your true north, so to speak. Um, you know, and that, that there's varying degrees of that. There's certain people that say, oh, you can read, you know, any type of Christian work, but it has to be this type of Christian work, um, you know, or you can read this or that, right? So it, there's there's that that general fear. Do you think there's that anything- was so specific, it, Sean. Well, that was very specific. Thank you for that. No, I get what you're saying. That is I, so I, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm verbally processing it, as Anthony would say. I'm, I'm still <laughs> trying to think the way to say it more concise, but- I'm glad you still picked up on it. My, my point is there's still that sense of fear. And do you, number one, do you think that there's a legit fear of get any sort of slippery slope when it comes to exploring other worldviews, either in or outside of Christianity, when it comes to this topic, or should we just expose ourselves to every type of belief and position? Um, I have a problem with the slippery slope argument because it starts with today and moves forward and assumes that we're moving down um like i think you have to take a, <laughs> the full perspective right sure. like what was the slippery slope that led to women's ordination oh it was abolishing slavery like that was a slippery slope mm. that led to women's ordination mm. you know what i mean like if you really look at it historically that like that's kind of how it's played out and and so you gotta like take the full picture in um but i think um I've got a couple thoughts on this. Um, people are becoming affirming more and more and more. The numbers are going up. Um, unfortunately, people are being ostracized for becoming affirming by their Adventist community. And to tell someone, you no longer belong here, but we expect you not to change. Mm. We expect you to act like an Adventist without being accepted in the Adventist church is crazy talk. <laughs> like if, if we want, like, like the church in so many areas in this needs to look at the results of their own actions and the things that they're doing and saying in terms of how they might be actually just like attacking people who see them something differently. And maybe the thing that's causing people to move a different direction is not that they became affirming, but that when they became affirming, the church turned on them and didn't really listen to the things they had to say because the church was so afraid. Mm. So if we want to avoid people becoming affirming and leaving the church, you're not gonna stop people from becoming affirming. It, we're moving that direction more and more and more. Look at some of the young people in the church, like make a space for people who believe this. Our, our church started making policy on this issue before they even feigned to look at the Bible on this subject. Wow. <laughs> they just started making policy and saying yeah. it was wrong. Alicia, can and I... By the time they started talking theology, the decisions had been made. Can I ask you more about that? You you do talk about that in your book, so people can go there uh, once they have that, but um, you, you sort of outlined kind of the process starting in the 80s all the way to the more recent statement by the seminary in 2015. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think, well, I guess you, you kind of just said it already, but that seems really crazy that a lot of the policy decisions were ahead of the just sitting down, opening the text with, you know, the, the best scholars in the room and saying, what does it say? But you have to understand the degree of heterosexism that existed in the church at that time. Like to be gay was to be completely unchristian, to walk away from God, to be like a craven animal who wants nothing but sexual stimulation. They, they, on the news, queer people, like gay men were called sexual perverts, like on the news. That was just what everyone called them. Mm. Like you have to understand, like for them, because they're, and it wasn't like just Adventism, 
Like it was like just society. You have to understand that for them, that was just a hard no automatically. Uh, and, and sadly, you know, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have done differently. I think that the calling we have in Christ is very, very high to really examine the scriptures and think that maybe we're wrong and really try to be compassionate and loving to all people. So I'm not saying that they should have, but it's like not surprising that they did. And so you have this theology that was formed in kind of this atmosphere of just real extreme, like heterosexism and, and bigotry towards queer people um, that's never been reexamined. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's a huge part of the issue. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll say at least I, one of the things I appreciate about your tone, not just in this conversation, but also in your book, is that you are you are very understanding of how, of what you what you term accepted theology of, and people who who hold that and what you mean by that and I, I appreciate your intentionality in coming to that word as well which was that it it is what has been accepted over a long course of, of time which is more of the what we might call the conservative traditional position but um but that accepted theology that you're very understanding of people and and their motivations and reasons behind what feel like harmful and hurtful actions to the lgbtq community but are not necessarily intended to be but it, that is the natural thing which is it's helpful to hear because as someone who is ha, has for a long time just like wrestled back and forth between the, the the question of scripture feels so clear on it but yet this also feels like one of those situations that is similar or akin to slavery and the abolitionist movement where it's like we're going to get to a place where we look back at this this is this is what I've I've felt and wondered in in recent years is we're going to look back at this and be like what were we thinking not caring about people and loving people you know um and, and doing all these other things but I say this to say that I really appreciate your tone on it because it allows for space for somebody who is wondering and has a lot of questions that aren't always the easiest ones to ask of someone in the LGBTQ community, it feels like it's safe to ask and it's safe to it's safe to, to have grown up and been formed by a lot of the stuff that we grew up with and have questions and not even necessarily come out to the same spaces as what you're what you're advocating for um, and yet still have like the acceptedness of that. So I appreciate that coming from 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 your side, because a lot of the times um, I think it's a misunderstanding it is it is on the on the side i guess it is the responsibility of of those of us who are in the majority to have a listening ear and to make the the effort especially to oppressed or hurt minority communities but it's it is also a gracious thing to feel from that community a feeling of hey i get why you know like i get i get where you're coming from to a degree yeah I that's just, that's appreciated I, I i really want to echo that alicia like reading your book i think i was surprised to feel like this book feels like it was written for conservatives, which and and which is so surprising because I think like I work for Southeastern California Conference. I've lived on the West Coast all my life. I move and operate in really progressive liberal circles, and that's definitely like I'm not afraid to admit that. And I on, even on this podcast, I think I've consistently had a voice leaning in that direction. But I think when I when I have read affirming books and different authors in this realm to me I, I it almost feels as if like well i can read this but like my dad's never going to read this <laughs> like as soon as soon as he reads your first page he's out like you, you're already approaching the bible in a way that he, he mm -hmm. can't even he can't even get past the front door but the way mm -hmm. and yeah so i just want to express a similar a similar just thank you for I don't know how you managed to do that. I guess I'm just like a little like impressed because, and I think really the answer seems to be like, that seems to be part of who you are. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of prayer and healing on my own part to be able to pull that off. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really, uh, yeah. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really grateful um, that that was achieved because that's what I really wanted. That That's what I really wanted to be able to do. So um, I've been so happy to get that feedback. Um, yeah, I was I was very impressed by that. If I could ask kind of one one question, I I, I do want to direct people to your book, um, which is it published yet? Or are you? Is it come out yet? Officially? Um, it's like in process of being shipped. So um, oh, hey, yeah, that's awesome. It's, nice. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, 
you know about all the shipping delays and all the <laughs> supply chain issues going on right now it's sure, really yeah. affected yeah so yeah it's gonna happen when it happens but yeah it'll well, it should I, be ready before too long i'm assuming we won't be finding it in our local abc but uh <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, you know, I want to direct people to your book because I think you lay it out in such a, like, a, it's such a pro, progress, I don't mean progressive in like a political stance, but you progressively lay it out in a way that um, builds a, a compelling argument, I think, over the course of the book uh, to be able to look at scripture in a way that is faithful to the text and yet is stretching and kind of pushing us and challenging us on how we may have thought that we were being faithful to the text, but we weren't. And then it, and, and even, and I think you're making the case for the fact that then that actually may free us from the dilemma of like, well, what do we do with this? What do we do with people who are mm -hmm. in the LGBTQ community? Um, when the text says this, you know, it actually frees mm -hmm. us from some of that dilemma. Um, I, I wanted to ask if you, uh, if you felt like this was something that in, 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 in essence could be, and I know you said this already, but I, I wanted to press on this a little bit, that this could actually be taught in um, seminary, not in the near future, I'm assuming, but in a way that like would be consistent and not come across like just a political, hey, like we are just affirming now, screw everybody else, you know, is there a way to be able to teach this in tandem with some of the other tensions we may hold on different views, uh, like, like different interpretations of certain pieces of scripture? I mean, I think that they should use my book for the uh, contemporary issues class at the seminary. I, I honestly think that they should. Will they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they should read both. You know, they should read yeah. my book and the seminary's book and whatever. You know, hopefully a response to my book will come out. And, and that yeah. could be read as well. You know, hopefully this will yeah. press people to work a little harder on their own theology and look at the text a little more closely. And, you know, and, and I think both of those should be read and studied at the seminary. Like it, it's an educational institution, right? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah I want to just, I wanted to swing backwards a step if I could too. Yeah, for the, sure. The conversation about, um, just about what if, and, and a lot, much has been written about this, about like, are we going to lose the Bible if we become affirming? Hmm. Um, I, I think, and again, this is why taking a broader lens and looking more historically is really helpful, because I think the way things appear in our moment is not always the way that they are in the big picture. Because when they were struggling with the concept of abolition, there were lots and lots of people who said, come on, let's get real. Paul was not kicking slave owners out of his churches. Paul was not an abolitionist. Like, like if we go with abolition, they're saying, look, who's who are the abolitionists? Some of them are Christian, but they don't take the Bible seriously. There's a bunch of atheists, a bunch of agnostics, there's, mm. there's secularists, there's people who are trying to just, these are the people who are arguing in, in favor. And, and I think it's so easy for us to vilify them, but we have to understand that they were sincere. They were sincerely seeking to defend the Bible. And they sincerely believed that if they took, went away from the plain reading of Scripture on these subjects, that um, we would lose our all respect for the Scripture itself. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they were actually completely wrong. The yeah. opposite mm -hmm. was true. People still use their staunch defense of slavery as evidence that the Bible can't be trusted. Literally, one of the books I most relied on, the whole thesis <laughs> of the wild. book, was you can't trust the Bible because the Bible always led people to believe in slavery. Yeah. Like, mm. Literally. And it's like, so so people are leaving, the young people are leaving the church in droves over this issue mm -hmm. and over this subject. And I, I get that it feels like you're losing everything if you open the door that some people could be affirming. But like the long-term impact, I don't think people have really wrestled with this. You know, people, some of these people, some of these people who are the, are the most staunch defenders of the accepted theology aren't connected to the queer community at all. Hmm. Or if they are, it's such a, such a cherry picked 
(laughs) section Mm -hmm. of that community that you know and it's it's you just you get afraid you get you have to get afraid at some point for the long-term viability of christianity and adventism when when really more and more people are looking at the church and not saying you know those people are so good and i wish i was good enough to be in the church they're looking at the church and saying those people have some ethical and moral issues and problems wow. and they're but, but leading say... society in the wrong direction and and like we gotta gotta wrestle with that and like own that and move into that a little bit more i, I think i agree with you uh without thinking too hard about it on all of that what would you say to someone who in response is like well we're being faithful and doesn't matter if everybody leaves like we're going to be faithful to scripture um because that is kind of the response it's like well, yeah, okay, everybody's leaving, but that's not my concern. My concern is faithfulness to God, and that, and mm-hmm. not everybody's going to be faithful to God. People are going to leave because that's the easy way, you know. Like, what do you? How do you Stay respond on the to straight that? and narrow? Yeah, and and to yeah. piggyback, and specifically the straight, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> there, I, there's a lot of theology. There's you the know. pun. <laughs> there's a lot of theology about you know the idea of the shaking. You know, the idea that almost that something like that should happen that that the you know that those who are not really faithful to god or the scriptures they should leave because then the true true followers you know the remnant. Um, yeah the remnant will be revealed yeah how do you how do you respond to that a lot of times the problem with those kinds of approaches is they implicitly just believe that they're definitely the remnant and that they're not the ones <laughs> right. who are shaken out very true <laughs> very true like it's just like obviously we're good because we're vegan so yeah. <laughs> i i think uh a lot of times sean she's attacking you i, I feel attacked <laughs> <laughs> i'm vegetarian i was a strict vegan for four years but then i wow. was shaken out i guess <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah <clears throat> yeah i think i my text is for people who my my book is for people who are at the point where they really want to know and understand the bible better and they're not assuming from the go that they understand it but they want to make sure that they do and if you're not in that space you're not going to read my book Mm. yeah i i kind of asked if you if you did but i I honestly to some degree don't think there is an answer if you're not willing to engage with with opposing viewpoints if you're always just scared of <laughs> of the slippery slope then it, you know you never actually end up moving because everything is a slippery slope so yeah I, I intentionally yeah. made a decision to address my book book to people who did have a degree of openness and not worry yeah. about those who don't because there's nothing i can do about that situation but yeah. if i move enough of the people who have the openness mm, yeah. see because people on that that degree away that distance are never going to listen to me but maybe they'll listen to their friend who will listen to me yeah yeah right and and so that's that's how change happens with those folks it's not through the difference i make with them it's through the difference i make with their friend who they respect an awful lot more than they respect me Mm. on that's fine well on that vein and i don't know if you're about to do this jesse i was going to ask a final question um, I think I already asked the final question, so yeah, true. you don't get to. And we circle, yeah, you, you've oh, already man, stolen so that cutting, from me. So you cut me off. If you ask oh, the final Sean, question, get that out. means I can't Sean, ask anything. Sean, oh. get out. Oh, no. Well, well, then it doesn't have to be the final question. I'll just ask this. Um, Penultimate. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, there have been some resources that have come out. The NAD sponsored Guiding Families of LGBT Plus Loved Ones. Um, that came out a few years ago. Do you think resources like this are helpful um, for the conversation? Do you think they're, or do you think maybe they're just avoiding the problem or, or yeah? Mm-hmm. I, I believe that one of the issues with how the church approaches the, the LGBTQ community is um, a greater concern with demonstrating or proving or stating that we're loving than with actually being loving so it's it's more about perception than actually trying to learn to love the queer community better Mm. and i believe that the guiding families book is more in the second category of actually trying to listen and learn and understand and love better i i'm a fan of that book 
even though I disagree with it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a movement in the right direction. And, um, and I appreciate it because it is coming more from a space of learning and understanding and learning and, 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 and being a bit more like respectful of queer, of queer people um, as we understand ourselves. And so I think that is um, a move that is in a positive um, direction. And I wish it got more airtime and was read more often. Um, yeah, that's how I feel about that. Yeah. <laughs> So well, kind Alicia, of, I'm going to cut off Sean right now. <laughs> Sean, go. Just go. Just go, Sean. No, I, I'll jump right off of that, too, because it, it partially answers my question, which is, you know, it, there, there are these two sides. And, and in our culture now, it just seems like you have to be on one side or the other to be friends and to Very be in polarized. the same community and to work together and to actually be on the same team, whatever it may be. And, and as Christians, it's much more personal. Like, are you with God or against God, for or against? And it's it's very heightened, right? I talked about the stakes seem very high, especially in Adventism uh, mm -hmm. of, of remnant uh, concepts. And so is there room when we look at affirming versus accepted theology for there to be people on both sides while still loving the queer community in a meaningful way? So can, can someone be pretty firm, even after looking at all these things, being open about having these discussions and saying like, yeah, I still hold that traditional biblical view what are what are ways that you can if at all still be loving as you as you talk about that's a really good question um i think first break down breaking down the idea that there's only two perspectives because there's like mm -hmm. so many perspectives um i could maybe characterize the perspectives as um a christian would never even call themselves gay because that's identifying with your sin and the gay lifestyle is a lifestyle of of uh you know just like animal like sexual just raw sexual desire and that's all that they are <laughs> you know this kind of really hyper um heterosexist kind of viewpoint so that's like a starting point and then there's other people who are like um, yeah, like some people are gay, it, it seems to be persistent, and it seems to not be a voluntary thing. And um, they should be able to say that they are, and that's okay. And they should be accepted within the church, which is the North American division, at least in word has moved in that direction, though not yet in action, because I don't know of any out gay celibate pastors in the Adventist church. Um, so, uh, and I know several people who have been denied being a pastor because they were celibate and gay. So um, they, they haven't moved that direction in action, but at least in word. And so I think that's some progress. Um, then you have other people who might say, yeah, I think, you know, I think that the church has got it right, but I think you can be a legitimate Christian and we can be in fellowship together, even if you disagree with me. And so that's like a whole different level, you know, and then there's there's other people who might say, um, you know, God's plan was not for people to be gay, but we make all kinds of accommodations because of sin to all kinds of things and the best way for people to live and to be, you know, to live in holiness and to contribute to their community and their families and society is for us to support this, even though it's not ideal. And then there's other people who are like, gay people are God's good creation and, uh, you know, we should celebrate this. And, you know, so there's like lots of different positions and there's questions about membership and questions about leadership, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, questions about sure. employment. Like there are so many different positions that people can take. Um, so I think kind of getting rid of the myth that there's like only two positions is really helpful. But um, I think that, um, when you when you want to answer a question about like what does it mean even if i ultimately personally believe that this is wrong how can i move to a direction of being more loving um and i i think that um that has to begin with shifting from a mentality of i am speaking this about you to I'm walking beside you in the pain and, and the difficulty of this. Like if you're going to tell somebody you can't have a family and children, mm. um, what are you going to do to walk with somebody through 
the incredible mm. sacrifice inherent in that and the fact that that kind of a life is at odds with the way we do church and the way society is organized so if you're mm. going to take that theological wow. position is it going to be you're speaking it from above to those people or you're you're beside and you're doing everything mm. you can yeah. to make their lives better or do they have an open door wow. invitation to your home to have mm -hmm. dinner with you and your family. Yeah. Are they going to be invited mm -hmm. on vacations with you? Mm -hmm. You know, are are you going to make a commitment to them wow. to be part of their lives? Yeah. On an ongoing basis that they know you're never going to leave because you've told them they can't have a partner that's never going to leave. So, are you willing mm -hmm. to step into that space? Um, which is something I've seen almost none of in the Adventist mm -hmm. church just yeah. to be frank. And wow. and so yeah, I mean it's uh, are you willing to give the same level of commitment that you're asking um, and walk beside people? Yeah, it's a, it's a higher calling. Like you're, Dang, no matter bro. what position you take, it, it, it doesn't matter either way. We haven't justified our, our way of action in, in the way we do community in our church. And that's both a personal and corporate kind of responsibility to re-examine, you know, not just the, the scripture, but also the action of just how do we deal like in the dissonance in the spectrum of how we look at these texts and, and the Bible itself on this, why is it we're at, no matter what you say, we're at this space. Now we're at the spot where there's been division, there's been hurt, there's been people that have left the church. So the fruits are there and whether or not you think it's affirming or ex uh, accepted theology is right. It doesn't excuse what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you bring up an important point that we need to re-examine mm -hmm. that there's a higher calling as Christians to to what love actually looks like. And that challenges me. That challenges me a lot of, of how to do that well. Yeah. And we've been so guarded. Yeah, I, I could talk really... forever. I'll just stop. We felt so guarded oh. about this topic that we just don't touch it. So then the people that are part of it, we don't touch them either in any way. And so that's been the problem. Yeah. And I want to go back to mm -hmm. something I said at the beginning, which is where is the weight of this question falling when the adults in our churches refuse to take it? Yeah. And it's falling on children, literal. Yeah, on this kids. is where I get emotion emotional because it's literally yeah. the yeah. weight of this is literally falling on children because the adults are not picking it up. And you can't wait. Mm -hmm. You can't sit. The, OK, so here's a conversation yeah. I've heard of that has filtered back to me from multiple churches <laughs> or Adventist churches or schools, which is. This LGBT thing is important, but we don't want to be political. There's no LGBT people in our church or in our school. So until someone like tells us that they're queer or they want to come to our church or they come, our kid comes out, let's not talk about it. That's a like there are LGBTQ people in your church, and there are definitely families of LGBTQ mm. people in your church, and and when you kind of take that kind of a let's wait and see mm. and is long as there's no conflict around me, I'm not going to move on this kind of an attitude. You are allowing that weight to fall on the shoulders of children. That's what you're doing. And it, it's uh, like, it's not, a, it's, it's really unacceptable. It's, it's really not okay. Like, if you don't believe in affirmation, like you really need to move and you really need to work because you're putting an awful lot even if you're not vocally supportive you're putting an awful lot of weight onto the shoulders of children and you better be the first one to move and to do something about yeah. this and to take action that's that's your responsibility and i, I just i think the church is a, a a long ways away from that unfortunately hmm. that's true <laughs> well i have one last question i'm just kidding i don't uh, but uh Alicia, I want to say thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast. Um, people can read your book, uh, The Bible and LGB, LGBTQ Plus Adventists. Uh, it's going to be available. It'll be available everywhere specific. at some point. But um, I think go to my website. They'll probably okay. be the best deal you'll get will probably be on my website at some points, which is just aliciajohnston.com and Johnston with a T. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. We'll put that in our show notes as well. And I just want to say thank you. Um, I know to, to, I just want to be perfectly frank with you. When, when we had talked about having you on, I definitely had a level of like skepticism just because of my experience with affirming theology <laughs> or my, my lack of, and, and the only experiences being, um, those of like 
of critiques that 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 are are um, pointing out the weaknesses of of some of the the, the Fermi theologians. Um, having read your book, uh, I'm going to leave kind of like a final position that I've arrived at, like into our reaction episode that we're going to have at the end of the series. But I will say that I think it makes a really compelling case for at the very least it being a legitimate line of the- theology, as you said earlier. Of being of someone can hold this and be a member in good standing. I, I think you make a very compelling case for that. Thank um, you for making my day. Where someone comes out, so I just <laughs> want, want to say that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much for being honest, and thank you so much for uh, taking the time to write a book that is, uh, I'm sure, not not something that's easy to write emotionally um, a lot of the time because it's it's a lot wrapped up in that. Um, for for you and for others as well that you care about so thank you for for being courageous enough to to, to face that thank so, you, you know, thank you for, uh, thanks, for, so, thanks so much for coming for on. having the guts to have me yeah. on as well thank you so much <laughs> for sure we're all uh we'll we'll all be uh, <laughs> authors as well because we're gonna get fired so <laughs> well give me a call if you do i've been uh, you no, won't be the kidding. first <laughs> okay perfect <laughs> thank okay, you bye. awesome Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Seeking What They Saw. This has been episode three in our LGBTQ plus Adventist in the Bible series. We will have episode four up for you guys in just a couple weeks, so you can stay tuned for that. Finally, just want to say a big thank you to Eric Edstrom, our producer, who now it looks like, let me just look at my notes here really quick. It looks like this is recent as well. It looks like it was maybe last week. He won the I'm a Hungry Boy in Disneyland Challenge Award, where the participant must eat a meal from every single restaurant in Disneyland in a single day. Wow, incredible. Eric, we don't know how you do it. We we, we just want to thank you, and uh, we'll see you guys next time on Seeking What They Saw. It.